This is Duke University. My name is Jay Sullivan. Um, I'm a sophomore here. And I'll be talking about oceans and about marine biodiversity. Um, so I'm not, I'm not an expert in this field as a, as a student here. Um, but I've grown up by the sea uh, my entire life. I've spent summers at the tip of Cape Cod, uh, where some of these images were taken, um, amid the whales, seals, and now great white sharks. Um, the oceans played a really integral part of my life, um, and it's something I deeply care about. And I'm troubled by how, in, over the course of my 19 years on the planet, things have uh, continued to degrade, um, and the impacts are very tangible. Um, 40 years ago, scientists and policymakers came together to make laws and policies to protect the environment. We're just starting to see the effects of these laws as whales begin to return to numbers that they may have been uh, during the 19th century and sea turtles have begun to lay eggs once again in places like the North Carolina shore. Um, the ocean itself is a long-term investment uh, in terms of return, uh, but we have to start now if we want to start seeing the effects uh, for a sustainable future. Uh, the laws that we put in place uh, all that time ago have kind of run out for the problems that we now are facing, and we all agreed then that it was necessary to do so, and I think we need to do that once again uh, in order to maintain the environments that we find so much value in. So, uh, moving on from there. Basics about the ocean. Uh, it's a failing system, as uh, have many have alluded to. Um, we've drawn down the assets we once thought uh, impossible to deplete. Uh, we may see an Arctic Ocean without ice uh, within our lifetimes. The seas are increasingly more acidic as a result of excess carbon in the atmosphere. Uh, fishing gear and trash litter the ocean. Uh, nitrification as a result of fertilizer use on land have created dead zones, including places like the Gulf of Mexico, um, in which very little survives. Um, and, as is, we're going to spend a little bit more time on today, uh, with overfishing, we're removing thousands and thousands of pounds of carbon-based life forms from the ocean in order to eat and survive. Um, and as a result of that, uh, we're running into a lot of issues in terms of both how our human society will continue to function in the future and also how the environment will continue to function. Um, and all of this happens as the ocean has only less than 1% of itself protected uh, while the rest is left open uh, as a common pool resource that anyone can pull from. So, fishing. Uh, it's a picture of me. It looks really cool. I didn't catch anything the day I went out fishing with this. Um, but uh, originally, when we would think about fishing, we think about people doing it locally. Uh, they do it sort of subsistence type fishing for their families and for their local communities, um, only really taking what you need to survive. And because of not really being able to transport fresh meat inland or other places, you would just essentially have the food that you could, you could catch for yourself. Um, and that allowed then for just sort of much more sustainable fishing practice, and this sort of happened before we were able to salt cod or have refrigeration in order to move uh, fish, move meat in over long periods of distance. But that's not the case anymore. So uh, modern methods of fishing is essentially industrialized, it's efficient, um, but it has a huge risk and detrimental effects uh, on the environment. It, or it pretty much epitomizes our exploitation of the resources that are at our disposal. We've eaten more than 90% of the big fish in the sea, 53% of fisheries are fully exploited, while 32 are overexploited, depleting, or are trying to return to past levels. Um, the, the issue that we're running into is as uh, all these issues sort of compound each other uh, over time, less and less of the fish is what was sort of mentioned earlier, less and less of the big fish, less and less of the fish that we want uh, to eat and we want to consume and also we think are very valuable are in existence in the water. Um, and, and to sort of work together within the whole system is the fact that we continue to develop along the shorelines, coral reefs continue to disappear and the, the sort of feeder of the system that you know, has the space for those areas, or for those fish to then come into the water um, that we can catch uh, are also being damaged. Um, the industry itself is no longer subsistence. Capitalism has rifled uh, the entirety of the ocean's resources and it's leaving us little to scrape on with in the future. Um, so it's important that we understand the mechanisms by which 
this happens. Essentially, the uh, majority of the fishing that we get, the, if you were to go to McDonald's outside here and get a fillet of fish and you wonder where your fish comes from, it happens usually from trawling. Um, trawling is a, a big net um, that goes all the way, um, sort of encompasses a giant area, and you can actually see it from above, which some of these Google Earth images are. They're really amazing. You can actually see the, the upkick of sediment and dust as a result of these huge nets dragging along the bottom. And oftentimes what happens is it's not just catching every single fish and living organism in its path, it's completely raking up the seabed and leaving just a muddy bottom uh, in which not much is able to survive. So you get a bunch of stuff that you don't necessarily want, um, and as a result, uh, the the whole the the whole system re requires that we need we only want certain types of fish so we're going to get bigger nets we're going to get more effective at catching the fish we want so even while catch numbers are going down we're catching what as more of what's little that's left essentially so the feedback loop continues as the more we catch and we still have the same amount of need and actually an increasing need as the population increases uh, we try and catch more and more, um, and as a result, we're, we're damaging and taking out things that we don't necessarily need uh, to take out. Um, studies are showing now uh, predictions that by 2048, uh, all fish stocks would likely collapse if we continue at the same rate that we're moving at, um, and that by 2050, due to global warming, uh, many of the big fish that we eat and consume will be 25% smaller due to the fact that there's less oxygen in the water that's warmer. Um, so essentially, problems that we're having uh, center really along the lines of how we uh, approach the environment, how we approach the oceans as a resource, uh, and how overfishing really stems from the fact that we're trying to feed a global system of food and we're able to, we're actually able to do it because of our technology, uh, but we have to be able to draw that line and that's something that's not currently happening. Uh, the results when you don't draw the line are pretty obvious. Uh, there's a really great example uh, in Canada. Uh, in 1992, the entire cod fishery, which had been in existence for hundreds upon hundreds of years, it was one of the reasons why Europeans made their way towards the New World in the first place, was due to the high amount of fish and cod that they could then salt and then take back with them. Uh, without that now, um, as a result of this uh, collapse that happened in the 90s, uh, down to about 1% of the, of the former population, uh, the whole fishery is essentially non-existent. So full moratorium was placed on cod fishing. All the people that relied on that uh, were forced to move on with their lives and th there was a huge amount of sort of economic hardship as a result of that. So what you see is that if we continue along this path, we're not only damaging the environment, we're not only damaging the amount of fish that are in the ocean and the ecosystems themselves, but we're damaging ourselves. And I think it's a very important and salient point when understanding the ocean uh, as a system and ocean as, uh, as a function of ourselves. The other thing that's, that, you know, this stuff is happening on a fairly daily basis. This year, uh, the sardine fishery off the west coast of the United States uh, ha caught absolutely no fish. They were unable to find them, um, and they've put that into a full, col they've now, like, officially labeled it as a collapsed fishery. Um, and they've, they've noted a lot of other reasons why it could potentially be the case. But if these things continue to happen, then we have people who aren't able to earn income, and we're also able not able to feed ourselves. And it also shows that our environment and the systems that we rely upon are degrading. So, how does this relate to whaling? And I know this seems like there's a, a lot of non sequiturs here. Um, the, the important thing is I think we, we've shown a systematic pattern of exploiting resources and continually going down a path of saying, well, we can just keep catching everything till it's not there and then we'll just move on and go from there. Um, but the problem is that's not possible or feasible moving forward. Uh, so, with whaling, what we did is we started out with these little rowboats uh, and what was called the Nantucket sleigh ride in some ways, uh, and we would catch whales and we needed them for the, the oil that they provided uh, to, to burn in our lanterns and to help run some of the machines that we had. Um, but then it sort of transitioned into this industrial system uh, in which we could quickly and efficiently capture whales. There was no sort of sport in it. We really was just like we're getting them and we're using their resources and using them as for food and, and a bunch of other different ways as well. Um, so it, it transitioned. When we make this transition, uh, we ended up really depleting them to a point at which that there was almost close to no return. Um, and we stopped, and we stopped back in the 70s around that movement uh, to protect the whales. And then uh, as a result, currently whale stocks have started to go back up, uh, but some actually haven't at the same time. So it's important to understand that even when you stop, and it, it may even be at a point where they're not going to go completely extinct, 
they're not actually going to change very much. I think a really great example are the North Atlantic right whale. Uh, they've been, uh, there's been a, the moratorium for the same amount of time. They've actually, numbers that, that were there when the moratorium was in place have not really changed. There are about 350 to 400 individuals left. They're extremely endangered. Um, but the problem is that because of long gestation periods with, with uh, creatures like whales and the fact that you know, you're only you know, having one born out of one whale after a year, uh, there's, there's a slow repopulation sequence. So, generals about how this all functions is that if we want to work toward fixing the ocean ecosystem, we should look at it as a system and not just as a bunch of individual species that exist in their own vacuum. Uh, so, I like this three-tiered approach. I think it makes a lot of sense. So protecting spaces is one of the major ones. When we talk about less than 1% of the ocean being protected, it's extremely important that we have spaces from which we cannot extract resources. And while it's very difficult, it's very important to have those, have those locations. Uh, the second has to do with combating climate change. And the reason why, and everyone always says we gotta do that, uh, the reason why it's important for the ocean is that uh, just like uh, the creatures on land, um, the oceans uh, are a part of this world. And if, if they continue to warm, uh, it, it changes the place where, where animals can, can exist. Uh, and thirdly, uh, we have to work on how we, fin how we actually fish and how we, how we do that sustainably. Right now, uh, scientists will say, we should only catch about like this much uh, fish from this fishery. And then policymakers will say, well, the industry says we need more, so we're just going to catch double that. And we're going to let the quota be a lot higher. And I think when we, when we don't allow the science to, to guide our policymaking, it becomes uh, very, tro uh, very troubling and problematic for the future. So, uh, the, the premise here is that change doesn't happen in a vacuum, um, and that we need to look at the, the system as a whole, as the ocean as an interconnected web uh, in which a lot of things interact. Uh, we saved the whales once, but now we have to save the oceans as a whole, the dolphins, sharks, turtles, mackerel, cod, and us. Um, and as was highlighted before, we are a part of the ecology. Uh, and so recognizing the fact that both we impact the ocean and the ocean impacts us and allows us to live our lives the way we expect to um, is extremely important for moving forward. We're extremely interconnected uh, to the fate of the ocean. And if we were to lose it and if we were to risk it by not changing our habits now, uh, the biodiversity of this planet and frankly us, we would lose the connection uh, that the ocean has in sustaining land life. So to wrap up, the important thing to remember is when we talk about um, broader sweeps of biodiversity, broader sweeps about how the, the environment and the ocean is functioning, to recognize that all the policies we make and all the things that we're talking about have extremely local impact in the lives of people and the lives of local, local systems. Um, so the, the important thing is that, start, that everything starts small and these local effects uh, blossom into these sort of more global shifts and how the, the system functions. Uh, small policies in coastline areas do, ha do affect and do help uh, increase the, the local uh, sustainability of a particular area, but we also need to look at how the, the broader system works as well. The situation in the oceans is dire, but it's not dire to a point at which the blue planet can't be saved. Uh, we're better than where we were, uh, maybe 30, 40 years ago, if we had continued along that path, we would be in a much different reality than we are currently. But we do have a long way to go in terms of fixing um, and working to understand our own behavior and how we can better adjust it so that the future of the oceans uh, remains mildly bright. So I'm going to end on why we should do it. Uh, I think the rationale is fairly clear in some ways. Um, but murky and others. I think that there's a sacrifice in taking the steps to say, we're not going to catch as many fish. We're going to look for other ways that we can protect the environment and we can protect the ocean system as a whole. Uh, and it requires a change in our behavior that is in some ways undesirable. But if nothing else um, about all these different policies and, and why we shouldn't just look at things individually and, and within a vacuum, um, I would ask you to consider uh, the, the beauty of the creatures that, that exist uh, on our planet and in the oceans. Um, I've been wowed throughout my life by having the opportunity to see things like blue whales and humpback whales in person. Seeing something uh, 100 feet long that's swimming through the ocean and while we uh, have no idea what their existence is like and cannot comprehend it nor empathize necessarily, we can understand the intelligence and the beauty of such creatures. Um, the biggest threat to the future of our planet 
to me is not necessarily a nuclear bomb or financial collapse, but it's the, de the degradation of our environment to a point at which we cannot restore or protect it anymore. So progress has happened, but I urge you to think for a moment of tomorrow's child, the future generations who, will who we will bequeath the planet to and in what state it will be in. A revitalized ocean rich with biodiversity from the largest whale to the smallest coral polyp can be our legacy, but only if we act together to make it happen now. And that would require a fundamental shift in our behavior and our understanding of how the ocean functions. Thank you very much. I appreciate you listening. Um, and uh, I hope that you learned a little bit. Thanks.